everyone. Welcome to WHTP Masterclass. I am Carrie Fabrice with Career Frame, coming to you from Dallas, Texas, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here with all of you today. I am going to simply just dive in to our presentation today around Reframe 2.0. It's about how to become the best version of yourself by thinking differently. What I'd like to ask you is if any of you have questions, if you'll just post them in the comment section for me, I'm going to, like I said, go through this presentation and then I'll come out of it. You'll see me pop back up on camera and I will start looking at the questions and answering as many as I can to the best of my ability. So let's dive into this and I hope you enjoy. So um, again, I wanted to say hello and because I know I'm talking to people around the world, uh, in Europe primarily, some in South America, some here in the US um, and some other continents, I wanted to just say hello in all of these various languages or a few various languages. So bonjour, buongiorno, hola, allo, hello. <laughs> and again, thank you for being here. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Carrie Fabrice and I have had an amazing career in travel in my first career life. Um, I started out at Travelocity and then moved to Google, was at Saber, Hospitality Solutions for a while, then was at re most recently at Travel Leaders Corporate and have also been in leadership for 13 of those 20 plus years that I was in travel. I recently pivoted um, pure passion, this organic passion of wanting to help people elevate in their career from good to great. And I pivoted over to being basically a career coach, consultant, and trainer um, of leaders, mid-level managers, and teams. And so I am a certified strength finder coach and trainer. I'm also a children's book author, just a little fun fact. I have a book called Fans Are Fantastic that I wrote for my son, fansarefantastic.com, a quick little plug for that. Um, and I am incredibly passionate about leadership and helping others excel, and that's why I'm here. For the next 30 minutes, I'm going to walk you through these three areas, basically reframing yourself for your career path, give you some leadership insights that are from me that I think that are important that I've looked at and I've experienced and observed through my career. And then also talk about managing remotely because most of us are doing that as leaders. And I think that there's been a lot of awesome content presentations and uh, workshops that have come out since the COVID-19 uh, crisis hit. But I always wanna just share my thoughts uh, around a remote team hierarchy of needs that I will share with you all at the end of this as well. Um, so let's dive into what is Reframe 2.0? Well, it's the experience and process of becoming the new version of you. So when you've got today, you're 1.0. So when you do things differently and you grow, you become the next version. So it's taking who you were yesterday and choosing to step into becoming the best version of yourself today and tomorrow at work and in life. And reframing or thinking differently leads to your ability to show up as your best self always at work and life. And of course, these days, work and life is a little too meshed together. So we need to be reframing, I think, in, in every opportunity that we get. Um, here are some things about what I think it means to show up. And this is bringing your A game. It means having integrity, honesty, truth with yourself and with others. It's being authentic. It's having self-awareness. Uh, self-awareness is key when it comes to especially EQ, which I'll touch on later and how important that is to have, especially in leadership. Doing what you say you will do and more, so it's being dependable and knowing that people can rely on you. It's being open-minded and inclusive. There's a lot of things happening in the world these days that we all have to make sure that we are extremely inclusive of others and therefore that we're collaborative and that we're allowing everyone to participate and to be part of what we're doing. Excuse me. 
We want to be effective and impactful to show up and you know, drive results. We want to be someone that others want to be around. I mean, the simple thing is people like to work with people they like and ultimately be a high performer. And I think if you do all of these things, that's when you are showing up to your to, to work, to life, just showing up as, as you. Now, to show up, let's boil this down to a couple things that I'd like to highlight with all of you. And again, these are things that I have observed and experienced and coached and trained on that I have found to be effective. And to show up, it's basically playing to your strengths, having an energetic focus, taking massive action and role modeling the way, um, having an own it attitude. And it's a little bit of can't versus won't. And I'll dive into that here in a second as well. And then constant growth. So let's go through these. So with strengths, the key to success is to fully understand how to apply your greatest talents and strengths in your everyday life. This is classic Gallup Strengths Finder information and research. People who focus on their strengths, according to Gallup, um, are three times as likely to report having an excellent quality of life and are six times as likely to be engaged in their jobs. Now, I think that in order to have an engaged team, you've got to find a common language. Again, I am a little uh, biased and partial to Clifton Strength Finder, being a certified coach and being incredibly passionate around that language and really understanding the positive psychology of let's focus on what you're doing right and keep doing more of that versus focusing on what you're doing wrong and need to do better. But there's also all of these, uh, all of these, um, there are several other great personality assessments as well that create a common language that are pretty popular. Myers-Briggs, DISC, the Enneagram is very trendy, at least here in the U.S., um, and there are various others. But it's finding that common language to basically drive strengths conversation within your teams. Now, as far as keeping an energetic focus, this is one of my favorite quotes. Um, by Tony Robbins. And if you don't know him, he is um, probably like the guru of people improvement, people development and self development. And I love this quote, because it's so true. And that is wherever your attention goes, energy is going to flow and results will show. So it's what you focus on is what you get back. And energy is so important. Because if you think about it, if your energy is low, then you're tired. And if you're tired, you're emotional. If you're emotional, you might be irrational, and when you're irrational, you might not make the best decisions and choices. So it's really keeping your energy high. And if you're not, high, if you don't have high energy, it's about finding how you can get it. And I don't mean to minimalize this. There's a lot going on in the world right now that is testing all of us and our energy levels um, and our stamina, etc. But it's a simple thing of just changing your physiology. Like I'm standing up right now presenting to you all and not sitting down because I want to make sure that my energy is coming through to you. And so it's changing your physiology. Stand up, play one of your favorite songs that makes you dance and move around. It's whatever you need to do to get that energy up because when your energy is high, you're going to focus on the things that you want to come back to you versus being low and attracting all of the stuff that you don't want. So this is a real important point that I hope resonates with you. Um, and it's all different types of energy, okay? So there's the physical energy, there's the mental energy, emotional, spiritual, it's everything. And they can be out of balance. I mean, you can have really high emotional energy, but no physical energy. It's, it, but they all, they're all different, yet they're all connected. So again, it's finding that way to help you get your energy up so your focus can go to where you need it to be. Um, the other thing about showing up is taking massive action, especially in leadership. And it's role modeling the way. You're the leader. So do things that you want your team to do and lead, lead the way. And so when they see you um, role modeling, then they're going to want to follow you more. There's going to be more loyalty. And they're also going to see that there shouldn't be any fear. And I think fear is really high these days as well. And so taking massive action, role modeling the way and showing people how you can be the high performer, even amidst adversity is, is really key and, and huge. Um, the next thing is about just kind of owning your success and, the, and the, the notion of can't versus won't. So how many of you say, I, I can't do this. I can't make this happen. Or I can't think like that. How many times do we say the word can't? every day. But if you change it, if you reframe that and you say, I won't, I won't do this. I won't think like that. 
feel how that changes literally like in your body, how that changes. Because when you're saying you can't do something, you are saying that you won't do it. So just own it. Okay. And if you won't do it, then you won't do it. But when you turn that around in your brain, it actually starts to create a little bit of a different type of action because you're like, wait, I'm actually saying I won't do this, but I, but I want to do it. So I guess I will do it, which means I can do it. And then you get to, I did it. So it's basically just that reframing of round can't versus won't. And then lastly, for showing up is this constant growth. Okay, so John Maxwell, another guru of leadership, if we're growing, we're always going to be out of our comfort zone. Now, that's what I do with working with my platform career frame is I work with companies, individuals, clients on reframing through the uncomfortable to get to the ideal. Okay, because in order for us to grow, we're going to be uncomfortable. And when we're uncomfortable, we learn. And if we stop growing, that's when we start dying. Literally anything on this planet, once it starts growing, once it stops growing, it starts dying. So constant growth, stay curious. And that will contribute to your constant reframing and your constant showing up and becoming that 2.0 version of yourself. So now I'm going to go into leadership a little more specifically. And here are some things, again, that I think are important when you're leading. So let's just kind of boil this down. It's about influence, EQ, 360 leadership, love and engagement, and then remote team needs. So when it comes to leadership, this is what leadership is not. Okay, It is not ego. It is not your title. You, you, don't, you don't get to command respect from a company or from teams or from people because of your title. You get respect because of going back to the last slides I just showed you, the energy, the massive action, the role modeling, the way, the owning it, the growth, those kind of things. Those kind of things. So leadership is not title. And it's also not manipulation. What it is, is it's influence. Leadership is influence. And here are some ways, according to the Center for Creative Leadership, of how you can influence. It's either logically, so you're tapping into people's rational and intellectual positions, it's emotionally, you know, connecting your message, your goal you know, with, with other people's goals and values. And it's cooperative. So it's collaboration, consultation, and bringing alliances together. So it's influencing to help people grow. That's what leadership is. It's also this awesome equation. Okay, so it's the logic, the IQ, but it's also the EQ. And when you have IQ plus EQ, it's XQ, which is execute, okay? So EQ is that emotional side that must show up for the party at, at work, okay? Because you're going to get more engagement from people around you when you have that self-awareness and that emotional piece um, of just compassion is really what that is. So bringing that EQ to the leadership table is key. Um, research shows that teams are much more engaged uh, and when you're engaged, you're productive. And I'll touch on that in a second. But they're much more engaged when there's more emotion, uh, when there's a balance, I should say, of emotion and, uh, and logic at the table. Um, there's also 360 uh, influencing. Now, this is a John Maxwell uh, concept where this really impacts like the middle manager. So if you're someone who is leading and you've got people reporting to you and you have your peers and then you have people that you report up to, this is so important of leadership. It's being able to lead to all of those levels. And again, leadership is influencing. So it's influencing all of these levels by being able to talk and guide, talk to and guide the people that report to you, but also be able to lead the people that are your peers. You know, we all coach each other. We all learn from each other. And then it's also being able to manage up. It's telling your manager, your boss, your C-suite, what you need, why you need it, here's the solution, et cetera. But again, it's influencing them. And when you have this whole 360 degree view of influencing, it is pretty impactful as a leader. Um, and then it's also about loving your team. Now, I was, uh, I had the pleasure of presenting at the Young Leaders Summit at Focusrite. Um, and this acronym got so much buzz and praise. And I first and foremost, before I talk a little bit about it, have to point out that this is not my acronym. This is Christopher Plumley's acronym. Christopher Plumley leads the Elevate Strategy Group. And this is his baby. And when he shared it with me, it resonated with me so much that I wanted to share it with others. And thankfully, he gave me permission to do so. 
But what he talks about is when you love your team, you will have a loyal, engaged, productive, results-driven team. And love stands for listen, observe, value, and empathize. When you listen to your people, you observe what they're doing, you value their contribution, and you empathize with what they're going through, what they need. A lot of people are overwhelmed right now. And so loving your team is really going to be impactful for that engagement and that productivity. Uh, and then again, this is what this is why you would love your team. Okay, so this is like a staggering statistic. And this is, to be honest, probably not even updated since COVID-19. And the numbers have probably gotten a little more disheartening. And so this is showing you how a typical organization is engaged. Less than 30% of people in an organization usually are engaged. That means half, over half, I mean, 52, 19% with this chart specifically are either not engaged or actively disengaged. So it's about loving your team, showing up, role modeling the way, bringing that energy, all of those things, and just having conversation with your people to make sure that they're engaged. And the engagement actually falls on you as a leader. Okay, so the individual contributors have to be accountable for how they show up as well, but they're looking to you to be that leader and to guide them. So the engagement really does start with you and the culture that you create on your team. So now I wanna transition as I start winding this down um, into our new normal of working remotely. And really this is today's office. And most of us have seen lots of webinars, lots of trainings, lots of workshops, lots of coaching and counseling around how to work remotely and manage remotely. Of the, of the 13 years that I was a leader, all 13 years of them, I was a remote leader. So I have some experience with this and I wanted to share what I call uh, a remote hierarchy of needs. But before I go into this, before anything else, I am hoping that everyone has found this now that we've been in this working from home group for several months. But this is the first thing that everyone has to do when they're working remotely. And as a manager, you wanna make sure that you're checking in with your people, that they have established a routine, that they have a rhythm, that there's some structure to keeping the work at work and the home at home, especially the people working in apartments and their, their office is the kitchen table. Like you've got to make sure that they're shutting down and dividing between the two. So here's my remote team hierarchy of needs. And if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it, it follows that format, okay? So I'm gonna go through each of these in a little bit more detail. And then, like I said, I'll pop off of uh, my presentation, come back on camera and answer some questions if there's any in the comments section. So we start with the employee safety and emotional health as the foundation. Notice it's not productivity and accountability as a foundation, okay? That's number two. We gotta take care of the people first, then productivity and accountability, then effective communication, personal connection and leadership. So let me go into each of these. So the first one, the foundation of the remote team hierarchy of needs is the emotional health and employee safety. It is driving connection with your team, it's encouraging healthy living, and it's having active dialogue around their well-being. Okay, so it's having regular team meetings, using video as much as possible, tell people to take their breaks. This is something that is so crucial and that I bet 95% of you don't do, and that is taking breaks. And when I say take a break, I mean, step, sit up, stand up, walk away from your laptop. Do not grab this. Like let the brain, let the brain rest. Uh, after about 50 minutes, five zero, your brain, your cognitive thinking kind of shuts down. So this is the whole working smarter, not harder. <laughs> you work smarter when you give yourself breaks and you let your brain rest. And most of us, my, I'm guilty of it as, as well, or just back to back to back to back to back meetings and we never move. And so it's really important that you do that. And it's really important that you leaders encourage your teams to do that. Um, and then with the well-being, it's it's making sure that their environment is 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 good. It's distraction free, which is hard for any of us that are doing online learning with our children. I understand. Um, but again, it's just checking in and making sure like, what do you need? Is there anything you need to make your working from home situation better and more comfortable. So checking in with employee health and, and emotional, or emotional health and employee safety is crucial to the first step of setting up a successful working from home environment. Second thing, second level is the productivity and accountability. So we've got to make sure that our humans are good and great, 
then we've got to obviously take care of the business. So then it comes into making sure that your team understands the expectations, especially if they're a little bit different from the working from home environment. It's monitoring business results. It's, it's also letting your team know like, hey, I'm going to be watching some dashboards. I'm going to need some call reports. Like you've got to show me that you're being productive. And it's also valuing and appreciating and recognizing your team. Again, people are overwhelmed because of burnout. So it's, it's the productivity. If, if there's a statistic that came out, and this was, I was on a podcast, and it talked about this, you know, people are worried, managers are worried that productivity is going down with their teams because they're working from home. That's not it. Because they're working from home, they're working longer hours, they're not taking breaks, and they're burning out, which is then contributing to the low productivity. So valuing, appreciating, recognizing like, hey, take the afternoon off on me. It's fine. Go breathe. That goes a really long way of making sure that your team stays productive. The next level up, effective communication. Um, and again, I'm just giving high levels of this. I do a workshop on this specifically that goes a lot more into detail. But for this today, I'm just giving some high levels. So with effective communication, structural, it's and, and tactical. Okay, so the structural is you know the consistent one-on-ones, the team meetings, it's creating the structure of the remote working environment. And the technology and the tools. So what tools are you going to use to communicate? Are you using Slack? Are you using Skype? What are you using to have the, the foundation, the structure for our communication strategy? And then when it comes to tactical, it's the act of listening. It's also messages match the channel. What I mean by this is there are a lot of companies that use Slack. It's an amazing tool. There are some conversations that should not happen on Slack. And so if it is... A, if it's an important conversation, please get on video to have that conversation. Tone is lost in text and in Slack. And so you want to make sure that your message is matching the channel that you're wanting to communicate, use to communicate. And then also have just an open calendar policy. People, we need more communication. We need more connection. So we've got to make sure that people can just hop on your calendar whenever they need to as a leader and reach out to you to ensure that they're staying in touch with you more so now that you're not seeing them as actively in the office. The next one is personal connection. So it's making an effort with compassion. So take two is what I say, and that is literally take two minutes at the beginning of every call to talk about life, family, interests before work. Don't just dive into the work. And here's another thing too, as a leader, I promise you, Several of you watching this have people that don't want to talk about personal. Um, I would push them a little bit. Why? Because all work, no play, no fun. <laughs> That's not really how the saying goes, but I don't know who knows the saying, so I'm just going to go with my own saying. But basically, you want to make sure that you're like, no, 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 no. Work aside, we'll get to the work conversation. How are you doing? What's going on? How are the kids? Or how's the cat? Or what's going on in your kitchen? Like, have some conversations. Find some unique ways to get people to open up because that's how you're going to start making a connection with your people and get creative. There's been tons of virtual happy hours. I am confident that probably every one of us watching this has, has been on at least one or 10 or 50 virtual happy hours. Um, and that was such a fun concept of being able to stay connected. And it's great when you do it with your team, also virtual coffees, uh, have virtual office hours where you're just on a Zoom and people pop in and you're like, oh, hey, what's going on? Like, just, just get creative to create that personal connection. And then lastly, in the hierarchy of needs is leadership. And there are four attributes of leadership. This also is a, another Gallup research uh, poll. So they Research, are they polled rather uh, followers, so people who were individual contributors who reported up to someone did not have direct reports. And they asked what were the four most important attributes in a leader. And this is what the research showed. Trust, compassion, stability, and hope. And my goodness, do we need all of these now more than ever, okay? So trust is probably not surprising to you that that is the core of every team. It is the foundation of every team. It is being able to trust each other, trust the leader, the leader trusts the team. It's having everybody's back. So you want to make sure that you have established trust with your people. And then compassion. So times are hard. It's having, it's trying to understand somebody else's position or at least empathize with someone's 
position and situation and giving them the space. Um, you can't give them too much space because you don't, there, are, there are people that will take advantage of it, unfortunately, but you'll be able to balance that. But it's having that compassion and making sure that people, your team know that, that you care, essentially. Um, stability, which is a tough one right now because of all of the uncertainty. So I would look at stability and hope and kind of mash them together into transparency. Okay. So be transparent with your team. Let them know what's going on. Don't scare them. Don't drive fear. But it is just helping them understand, like, this is what's going on. I've got you. I've got your back. Here's what I'm going to do. That's where you're create, creating as much stability as you can. Again, I know that one's a tough one because of the uncertain times that we're in. Um, but then give them hope and just say, we will get through this. This too shall pass. And we will rise stronger than ever. You know, I personally have been looking at um, COVID-19 as the great corrector. It is correcting so many things. It's unfortunate that the world literally had to have this to make changes and to reframe. So that's what reframing is all about, is looking at, okay, what's the lesson I can learn here? Where's the beauty in this? Even though I am on my knees, done with the situation. I am lost. I don't know what's going on. There's a lesson in there somewhere. And when you reframe to look at that, that's when you can start to really step into the 2.0 version of yourself. So as I wrap up here, I want to just ask you to think about what is your reframe 2.0 going to look like? So if you are going to become the next version of yourself starting today, what does that mean? What does that look like? What's your why? Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to change? Why do you want to stay exactly where you are? But what, what are you going to be doing to do your reframe to step into the next awesome version of who you are meant to be? So with that, I want to leave with you in life and leadership, you reframe, you show up, and you go change the world. So I am going to hop back on video and see if I, hopefully I don't mess this up, and see if I can, there we go, see if I can answer some questions, <laughs> if there's any questions. Um, I also really quickly want to just let you all know that you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Carrie Fabrice. You can find me at careerframe.com. Um, my email is Carrie at careerframe.com. There's a lot of Carries and career frames going on here. Uh, but please reach out to me. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Let me know how I can help you and support you with your team. With, um, with you individually, with coaching, with my coaching program, just what can I do to help you from a, a strength perspective and a, a coaching perspective. So I'm gonna go and see if we have any questions and I'm seeing some hellos from some folks, um, but I'm not seeing a lot of questions. And so if anyone's got anything, let me hear from you. <clears throat> let me just see. Okay, let me hear we got some questions now. All right. so. How do you adapt to cross-cultural teams the best ways that they, we all align the language? Great question. And I will tell you, if I, if I don't have the answer, I'll give you my best answer. Um, with cross-cultural cross teams, I would say that we're all still human beings. We're all still people. So even though we have different cultures and we come from different places, there, there's this common, common thread of humanity that we have. And I don't mean that to sound woo woo and not businessy, but that's basically, that's basically it. It's finding something that you all do connect around. And to be honest, the assessments that I referenced earlier, Strength Finder, DISC, Myers Briggs, et cetera, are great ways to create a, um, a, a language where you can align across the cultures because it's all uniform with the assessment results but it takes into to consideration where you come from and how you think and what you do and how you feel, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's what I would do. Um, let's see, how often should one have assessments with teams and surveys and feedback? Okay, that's a great one. So with assessments, um, I'll speak from a strengths finder perspective since that's my, that's my world and that's what I'm certified in. Um, you know, typically Gallup doesn't recommend that you retake a strengths finder assessment multiple times. Um, however, um, I have taken it twice myself, five years apart. And what I've seen is that there are some of your talents that don't change. 
because that's just who you are, how you were made, the cloth you were cut from. And then there are some things that will change because of life experiences. So it's the nature and the nurture piece. Um, I think that to take an assessment probably once every three years would be great. Um, if you if your team is changing frequently, and we hope there's not high turnover. If there is, please call me. But if there's not, then I think that still that that one to three years or that every three years probably applies. Um, surveys. I would, I, I think surveys every year are, are pretty important. Um, oh, and really quickly about the every three years of an assessment. Why, why three years? Because you will change and you will have different life experiences. When I decided to retake mine, I had had a massive transformation. I went through my own reframe 2.0 and therefore I knew that some things were different and I took the assessment to confirm and just kind of see in the data. Um, anyway, so back to the surveys. I think every year for sure. I think six months is is too frequent. Um, I think once a year is a perfect uh, perfect uh, frequency to really see what what's going on with your team. Um, great one. What is the limit with transparency? Is there one or should there be? Yes. Um, the, it is a fine line with transparency. Okay, so because if you're too transparent and you're just telling everything to your team, you can teeter on the team starting to really not respect you or really trust that you know what's going on, okay? Um, if you are, I think with transparency, it is letting them know the facts of what's going on, not as much your opinion of what's going on, okay? Now, you, can you share your opinion? Sure, but that's the one I would probably be cautious on. But with the transparency, it's sharing as many facts as you can. Again, that doesn't drive fear because there's a lot of fear right now and you don't want to create that fear um, by being honest and open and transparent. So I would stick to the facts, uh, end with something positive on the high note. What, what's the hope? Okay, bring that hope back in and then you should you should be good. Um, I definitely want to get a culture of diversity of thought, but there's sometimes a gap how to get aligned. Yes. Um, I, I would, with that one, let me read this again. I desperately want to get a culture of diversity of thought. But there is sometimes a gap how to get aligned. Okay. So not to be a broken record, I apologize. Um, but with an assessment, when you do assessments with a team, you will see those gaps. So if you were to bring someone like me or somebody else, whoever, whoever works for you, um, into work with your team, we look at those gaps and an outsider who's objective can call out the blind spots. And I have found in my workshops and team meetings that I do, when I call out those blind spots, that's when the ahas happen. That's when the conversation really starts to pick up and see, I can do that because I'm objective. I don't work for the company. I'm that outside consultant saying, Hey, you guys need to know this is going on. And here's why you need to worry about it, or here's why you need to care. And so that's what I would say. Um, I love that you want a diversity of thought. Um, that's very, very important right now. So I would just say, if, if the person who asked that question, if you are the leader, I would, I would take charge with bringing someone like me into your organization to help you assess. Um, if you are you know, an individual contributor, then I would have the conversation. Reach out to me on LinkedIn, connect with me, and I'm happy to help you figure out like how, how to have that conversation appropriately to get that diversity of thought going on um, and have a table that there is a gap, basically. Um, okay, now I've got a question from Erica. How do you self-motivate? Are you asking me specifically how I self-motivate or a general you? <laughs> um, I'll share what I do. So. I, I've got a lot of energy. I'm a happy person. I want people to be the best version of themselves. And even I have my days where I do not want to get out of bed. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me with this day that I have to face? Um, there is, for me, and I don't mean to make this sound so minimized and easy, but I choose to get up because when I'm sitting there in my lull and I've got my low energy and my 
you know, I'm tired and I'm irrational and emotional. I have to very much say, okay, sit up, change the state, change your physiology. If I don't do something, what's going to be the consequence? And if I do it, what's going to be the awesome result? And so I, for me, it is, it's a brain hack. It's just changing how I think. Um, and it's, again, that constant reframe of what is the ideal that I want? And if I don't do something, what am I going to get? And how's that going to feel? And how's that going to discourage me? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I change my mood. I get motivated. I change my energy. If you don't have energy high, it's going to be hard to get motivated. So I change my energy by standing up, putting on a song that I love that makes me dance and shake around. Even if I am in the worst mood or if I'm tired, I just do it. Um, so again, don't really mean that to sound so really, that's it. There's, there's no mind blowing strategy, but that's, that's how I do it. Um, there's also this fabulous woman, Mel Robbins. If you haven't heard of her, Google her. She's, she's phenomenal. Um, another like be your best self guru. Um, she has the five second rule where you start and you just count five, four, three, two, one and launch and go. And so that's a great book that you can read as well. Just to kind of, again, another brain hack. Um, okay. Another question just came in. Um, and I'm going to hope that someone will let me know when I need to wrap this up. <laughs> so I don't just keep going and, and uh, wear out the time here. Um, how can you listen better to people? sort of active listening best practices. Okay, so listening better. It, it, I think that you have to make sure that you are making eye contact with the person and you know, get these, these days over camera, but it's making eye contact with the person and it's repeating what you heard them say. If you are repeating what you heard them say, they know you're listening. And a lot of us who struggle with listening, we're just, oh my gosh, can this person just stop talking so I can get my point out? We interrupt a lot because we just want to get our point out. And that's not active listening. I've been guilty of that before. Um, but with active listening, it is really just like all distractions away. It's leaning in. It's really like, okay, go. I'm listening. Yep. Yep. And you're, and you're like, yes, I hear you. Oh my gosh. I, I bet that was hard that's so great, like whatever, it's, it's contributing to the conversation and, um, and then repeating, you know, what you heard them say. That to me is, is the best practice. Um, another way just to engage in dialogue to get people to talk so you can hear what they have to say is to also ask questions. Um, that will get people talking and then, then you can listen for the answer that you're looking for. So I hope that that helps. Um, Okay, here's another one that came in. Typically for sales teams, there needs to be a healthy competition. How do you ensure that there's collective energy and support within a sales team? Okay, let me read this louder so you all can hear. Typically for sales teams, there needs to be a healthy competition. And how do you ensure that there is a collective energy and support within the sales team? I think this absolutely starts with the leader of that team. It is crucial for the leader to set the stage, to set the culture. This is what this team is about. Now, people who are competitive, there's two ways to look at competition. You're either me, 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 it's all me, I'm going to be number one, or there's we, 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 we are going to be number one, okay? There's a difference. And for a successful, collaborative, competitive, fun, team, you want to go for the we. And that starts with the leader. The leader really has to tap into how are you creating this, you know, this question, I'm sorry, not this question. How are you, how are you creating this culture of fun competition? You can do games, you can have people team up where they're, you know, hold each other accountability from a fun, fun place. But it does really start with the team um, to be, to create that fun, competitive, we will win competition. I hope that helps. Um, okay, so I think that is it for my time. Um, again, I'm Carrie Fabrice with Career Frame. Thank you for listening today. I had a lot of fun sharing my thoughts with you all. And again, reach out to me on LinkedIn or come see me at careerframe.com. Email me at Carrie at careerframe.com. I'm on Instagram at careerframe. Um, 
I think that's pretty much all my bells and whistles and handles. So thank you very much. And I will see you next time.